Hey! Hello! It's me again, Chaz Evans, Director of Exhibitions of VGA Gallery, and your host for this brand new episode of VGA Fireside. As always, I like to try to tread the path of gratitude, which I believe is the true path. So I have many credits and thank yous to start us out with. First of all, I'd like to thank our producer and Director of Operations for VGA, Bryce Pauls. Hello, and thank you, Bryce. I'd like to thank the designer of our graphics 
and everything we do here at VGA and the Director of Communications of VGA, Eleanor Schicktel. I'd like to thank the VGA staff and the VGA board for their continued support. And I'd like to thank the Independent Game Designers Association Chicago chapter. Thank you, Ross, for helping spread the word. And please welcome all of you IGDA members if you are joining us tonight. I'd like to thank the Media Arts and Game Design module. Uh, thanks to Oske for helping spread the word and welcome Magni Module students. I'm glad to see you if you've decided to join us this evening. And thanks to the DePaul Game Development students uh, for joining us. If you uh, hope things are feeling okay in the uh, trying times of finals, I uh, hope we can provide a break for you uh, by joining us here on the stream tonight. And thanks to Caleb for helping spread the word. I need to thank Electric Mirrors for the very groovy intro music that you were just enjoying. I would like to thank the Oldham Mu Music Center Youth Brass Band for the fanfare you're about to hear. And if you know of an organization or group that would be interested in this program where we talk to artists who make video games or have any feedback for us of any kind, please drop us a line at info at vgagallery.org. We would always love to hear from you. Well. That's it for my credits and thank yous at this stage. So, without further ado, please, Super Producer Bryce, hit us with that opening fanfare. Yes! The fanfare is played. Thus, the session of EJ Fi Fireside has come to order, and I can finally uh, begin to introduce and welcome our very special guest that I'm very excited to have on our show today, Kevin Zoon. So, VGA Gallery welcomes Chicago-based video game developer Kevin Zoon as a speaker for VGA Fireside. Zoon is a creative director at Young Horses, where he has worked on such hits as Octodad and Bug Snacks, which is currently available for PSs both four and five, as well as computers. They also participate in game jams and make experimental games in their spare time. Everybody at home, please help me welcome Kevin Zoon to VGA Fireside. Welcome, Zoon. Oh, uh, hello. Greetings. How's it going? It's going well. Glad to hear it. It's uh, really an honor for you uh, to be joining us here on VGA Fireside tonight. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I, it's, it, the, the pleasure is, is all ours. Isn't that right, Super Producer Bryce? I assume okay. Bryce says yes. Uh, yeah, I was looking yeah for it. absolutely. Oh, God mic mode. Very exciting. I was fishing for one of those... Um, you know, those interstitial graphic comments, but we got God Mike instead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's plenty to talk about. Uh, oh, Bryce is there in the graphics there too now too. Uh, we wanna talk about your work with Young Horses. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, as you, uh, was just mentioned in our, our welcomes and thank yous, uh, likely uh, a lot of people trying to get into the field of video game making. So. Uh, we would love to talk to you about your experience uh, breaking in and, and making such projects as Octodad and Bug Snack. So let's, I guess, start from the beginning simply by asking soon, how did you get involved in video game making? Well, uh, the, the, the long answer or the short answer? <laughs> let's go with long ish. All right, long ish. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, uh, I've been making games since I was very young. Uh, I Before I had a computer, I was making board games uh, out of paper and pens. Because, um, I don't know, just the idea of making my own games was really fun to me. Uh, even though they didn't make any sense when I was a kid, but that's just how it goes. Uh, but I think uh, my parents noticed how much I would create physical games. Uh, and they wound up getting me some game making software. Uh, on the PC, that was click and play, just like that, the that user was the other platform, click and play. Yeah, it was a, a user friendly version of Multimedia Fusion, if you know that one. All of it is a precursor to like what is now Game Maker Studio, right? Um, and so I made some early simple games with that, um, and that kind of really sparked my interest. I uh, 
instead of doing math class, I learned how to make games on a TI-83 calculator. <laughs> um, so still I was using, still making use of the tools of math class, but not quite. So yeah, not, not the way they wanted me to. Right. But math class turned into programming class for me. Oops. That's, uh, I mean, the, 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 the TI, you know, distribution network of games is, is a fascinating, and I think under, uh, under covered, uh, under historicized, uh, you know, part of games culture. Did any of your creations at that time get traded to other people's TI calculators and, and, and passed around? Uh, I mean, I traded them locally to friends of mine. So for sure. Uh, and I agree with you that the TI-83 game trade was monumental because that's yeah. what got me into making the games because uh, people sent me games that I was like, oh, I could make one of these, especially like text adventures, because you can do that on the calculator. You don't need to do it from an external computer. Uh, and so I made like full RPGs in that thing. <laughs> That's terrific. Do you remember um, any early early titles that you completed in that in those days? Yeah, the, the first one I made was called Z Quest for Zune Quest, you see. Ah. Uh, and that, that was just a basic uh, you go out and fight slimes and a dragon style <laughs> RPG. Yeah. But like but the fact that I made it by myself on the calculator, I don't know, that was important to me. I also made like a haunted house choose your own adventure game, which I believe was just called haunted house because I hadn't figured out that titles are important back then. <laughs> hey, you were just going for an iconic, you know, sort of like platonic just haunted house. Yeah, yeah. I I sort of like I think this is a, probably a bad idea, but I sort of want to ask the audience: Are we still dealing with TI calculators in math <laughs> class for? For high school level education, and if so, this is still a great way to break to break in uh, into the practice. Are we? Are we still figure. I, I don't know. I think I've heard different reports on on people who are currently or are about to go into high school. Gosh, I don't know. Yeah, so right. I was dating myself and and distracting from the story you were telling us. So you're 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 getting used to the world of game making on calculators. What's yeah. Next? Then, then I did, uh, around high school, I did RPG Maker. That was the thing I really got into because I just love RPGs a lot and wanted to make my own. And and kind of the, uh, I also started doing Flash a little bit, but I never really did that as much. The, the point is, like, all of these um, systems involved, like, small indie uh, communities on the internet that kind of passed their knowledge around. And the main thing I would do is like download as many projects as I could and tear them apart to like find out how they were made so that I could do it. And that, that was sort of the, my creative spark for getting into the uh, game making field. And it makes sense to me now that, oh, of course I went into indie games. Like at one point I thought I was gonna go more into the traditional studio system, but like uh, everything I was raised on, like I didn't have as many traditional consoles growing up. Like mm -hmm. I just played games off the internet mm -hmm. made by people like me. So um, like, but as a result of a lot of my, my uh, early game making, I wound up uh, like I decided I was going to go to school for games. Uh, and at the time there were only like a couple of schools that even did it. And DePaul was one of them. Right. It was like that, or I went to DigiPen across the country. Right. The options were slim. At, do you mind sharing what what slice of history this is, when when those are your options uh, for higher education and games? That would have been that would have been two thousand six, I believe. Okay. Okay. Was the the first year of college for me, and so yeah, definitely back then. And DePaul's games program was only a year or two old at that point, so it was just a brand new field as far as college was concerned. But so I lucked out in that sense that there was a. A, a college in my state that would even do it. Right, there, there, there was one with a, a program that was fledgling yet established. Mm -hmm. And and this is a separate conversation that's, that's interesting to me as an educator. It's like there's still, that, that fledgling programs are still propping up, you know, constantly. Uh, oh, of course. Um, yeah, but that, that, so that, that, that was an option that was ready for you then. Uh, I appreciate what you just mentioned though about, you know, we do want to know what kind of tools uh, you can grab uh, that are at hand that you know can make sure that you can break into do, do something practical quickly. But it sounded like there was uh, the communities that uh, 
resonated with the tools were just as important as the tool itself. Yeah, right. absolutely. Because like I one time my parents gifted me like this massive tome uh, about programming uh, engines, right? Because they're like, oh, a book about programming. Kevin will like this. And uh, I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it because I wasn't a programmer, right? Like fundamentally, I've only ever been a scripter. Uh, like I can, I can make levels and characters, but I can't program a, a game engine. <laughs> No. Um, and and that was kind of it is that I couldn't read out of a book how to make a video game. I had to learn it from a practical experience. For sure. Well, the, just um, a, a, another vote of confidence for, for for well, I think there's a there's a sort of truthism out there that there's like an MD boom historically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, late 2000s, 2010, and often the the proliferation of, of free or, or cheap uh, game engines is is cited as the, the rationale for this. Uh, but just the the, you know, the 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 brief part of your story that you've already mentioned mm -hmm. already kind of interrupts the, the, that narrative that it's a little more complicated than that, right? That, that just just having tools around does not necessarily support uh, a new uh, a wave of practitioners joining the field. Yeah, I, I do think it's more complicated than that. I think that support uh, is more all encompassing when it comes to making a game. And that's true of uh, making a, not just making a game to release on the internet for free, but also trying to make a studio, right? Like right. Th th these are not things that you can just know how to do instantly. Well, I, I also like to ask, you know, because uh, games and, and software are meta medium that, that in, include uh, other media, while you are, uh, you know, growing your experience learning about the field with calculators, RPG Maker, mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. online that are uh, fun to exchange ideas with, are there other kinds of non game media that are uh, important to you in this era of your life? Uh, abs miles. Absolutely, a hundred percent. There are. I mean, I I'm I fully believe that uh, if you want to, um, if you want to create, you should have like a full diet of experience, uh, and not just focus on the your field. And granted, I play a lot of video games. Frankly, <laughs> too many video games. But like uh, in recent years, especially, I think that. Um, I've taken a huge amount of influence from cartoons, uh, specifically Adventure Time and Steven Universe, um, as far as like uh, making media that is like fun and absurd, but also deeply serious and heartfelt, uh, which can like kind of appeal to a wide, wide range of people, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. It sort of spans a gap, so you and you can kind of have it always as a as a maker of media where you're dealing with a subject matter that is important to you that needs to be talked about, but mm -hmm. still has multiple paths of access to lots of different kinds of audiences. Does that some, was that what you mean? Yeah, for sure it is. <laughs> Great. Um, so um, the animation is, is uh, added into the mix and uh, now you're studying at DePaul. Uh, what is, the experience like, uh, you know, as a, a student in higher ed, um, you, you've, you have been working on games, and now you, you're, you're trying to study more, you're trying to join the workforce. What, what part of your practice in games at that stage is coming from the institution, and what is uh, coming from your interactions with other people like you, and, and, and you know, just like working on your own? Great question. I, I mean, like, what helped as far as going to classes was organizing like my own education as far as like what is important to know uh, because I certainly didn't know anything about the theory of games uh, right. going into school and I do think it is useful to know um, and I also like hadn't learned how to use C++ before I like didn't know about pipelines uh, there was a lot about the business of games that I w didn't know. Uh, and so like, even if I had like kind of um, some of my own personal experience with uh, learning and developing 
uh, games with tools, like I still didn't really understand how to make a game as a project. And that was a new structure, you know, four odd years offering you that like, there, are, there are actually all these things that the, the creative practice needs to be fit into uh, yeah. to make it real and present it to the world. So uh, what particular projects came out of that part of your career that we can talk about? It, oh, are you, are you talking about Octodad? <laughs> I think I'm talking about Octodad. Uh, yeah, tell us, where, when does that, to the story of, of how that, that comes out of your experience as a, as a student at DePaul, and then maybe, if you're willing, you might uh, uh, allow us to see a, an early demo of Octodad that is, that is of or maybe slightly after that time. Gee, uh, absolutely. So to, uh, to get right into it, like Octodad as a, uh, a student project was a, it was like a, a big summer project we did uh, as part of the DePaul program. Um, it was uh, 18 people, I believe, uh, interviewed to be part of this project because our singular goal was to make a game that could enter in and win the Independent Games Festival a student <laughs> showcase. Just a regular, like, just entry level, just try it out kind of goal. <laughs> Starting out, see what happens. Our only real request here is that it wins the Independent Games Festival. <laughs> well, I mean, that was our... It, to me, it was good to have that goal because yeah. it meant we had an audience in mind. <clears throat> like, we knew what the purpose of the game was and who was going to play it. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to just kind of get lost in the weeds with ideas for games. Um, but if you know why you're making it, it really helps inform what it is you're making. <laughs> Uh, and so that that process, we we were coming up with game ideas. Octodad wound up being the winner of all of our pitches because it was I don't know it was funny and lighthearted and like pretty new. Um, How many pitches would you say the group would have to get through to to land at Octodad? Uh, well, every single member of the team had their own pitch. I think they had at least two, so that's at least thirty six games. Uh, so 35 of those didn't get made. And I'm, I'm sure they're all just waiting in the wings, waiting to be made. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, what I find really funny, and this happens uh, every time we go about pitching games, is that most of the pitches that we didn't make that day got made by someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that good game ideas, you know, you're not the only one who's going to have it. Um, yeah. And it's okay. That's perfectly uh, fine and normal, um, because ideas are only worth as much as like you've built them. Oh, so you mean it wasn't that someone in that group went off and made the game? No, that, I just mean the know, game. Like organically, the same idea came out of another part of the world. Yeah, ethereally, it all just comes to be. Yeah. Um, and uh, in some ways, we're like, oh, dodged a bullet on that. If we had made the same game as someone else. We'd be in like, trouble now. Yeah, but we happened to pick the one game that only we would make. And I think that's a big, that that's like a big factor in how we choose our games. A lot of people uh, make hay about like how weird Bug Snacks is as a concept. And we're like, yeah, but no one else was going to make it. So we did. Yeah. <laughs> like no one would have even thought of this one. Yeah, well, they call it strategic differentiation in, in business school. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, so the, the Octodad came out of a, a whole milieu of ideas, a large group of people. Uh, would you mind giving us a practical demonstration of what Octodad looked like in its early days? Yes, I, I do think, though, I have picked up uh, some deadliest catch levels Okay. And not the original student Octodad. Okay, okay. Well, so we, we're, what, tell me, then just... Tell us what point in time we're zooming to. Uh, so this would be a year after the student game came out. Right. Yeah. Which not not that big a span of time, all things considered. Yeah. Um, but hold on. I will now share my screen. So here we go. So this is uh, the 
early blackout version of the boat level from Octodad Deadly's Catch. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is like uh, my first swing at making a level when it's just blocks. Like one day there will be real art. Uh, you can see like this is early enough that here is um, one day these would be fishermen. Uh, but is all we have. Bad? Yeah, that's a chef. <laughs> um, that's the chef from the first Octodad student game. Uh, we hadn't remodeled him yet. And so anytime I needed an enemy in the game, I just put chef in. Chef, chef slash fisherman. I've attached a giant light to his face to indicate what direction he's looking. Mm -hmm. um, so like at this stage, like this was like after we had done our Kickstarter. Uh, so like after the student game Octodad came out, oh good the uh, quest system still works. Um, <laughs> Great. Like, kind of the, the... Oh, the suspicion system does not work. So actually, I did not need to sneak past these guys. <laughs> you still wanted to perform it, just because you know it was the right thing to do. Of course. Well, I mean, I, it's been so long that I don't even know which systems are in and which aren't in this version. Yeah. But... But that's kind of the thing. Like on a systemic level, Octodad doesn't all the way exist yet. We have the main character, um, but this is otherwise just a rough level idea that m I've promised myself will work one day. Right. <laughs> um, and so well, let me try to guess what's sort of go going through your head as also as a way to describe for those who maybe are uh, being introduced to Octodad for the first time. Uh, and also oh, to get a, a sort of verbal picture of what's going on. We have, uh, we decide the player character is going to be an octopus in a suit and tie. That's right. Uh, and uh, movement uh, is going to be a challenge of a brand new bendy unbalanced sort that is never seen before in games. That's like the movement of our player character. And then the, you're gonna have to uh, uh, unevenly navigate different obstacles and terrains such as this boat. We're on a boat right now and that they were uh, enemies that were sort of meant to be fishermen, but they're actually chefs. That's, that's right. <laughs> uh, and I mean, like uh, in most situations, the Octodad, because uh, he is uh, pretending to be a, an ordinary human father, uh, he cannot let anybody know that he is secretly an octopus. Right. Uh, and so he must sneak around throughout various uh, mundane and wacky situations, uh, not being spotted and blending in. Like if Hitman had to do groceries, right. <laughs> it sucks to dead. Yeah, and so it, it is a way, way to practically and uh, interactively uh, keep on expanding on this sort of gigantic elephant in the room joke or octopus in the room as it were. Of course. Um, and so, uh, what were these? Would these boxes? So right now we're we're, we're navigating some boxes. What what would the, the intention of these be, or would they actually just end up being boxes, like the kinds of ones you'd see on a ship? Uh, yeah. So a lot of these would be like shipping containers uh, or crates of fish, <laughs> what you would expect to see on a fishing boat. Uh, missing from this area would is a uh, giant crane that is important in the final game but we hadn't thought of it yet. Um, like the, these moving boxes though, you're right. These are just literally going to be boxes in the future. <laughs> um, I, the gray box demo is easy to decipher. The boxes <laughs> are boxes. Uh, I do think it's important um, in gray boxing to try and get as close as I can to the shape that something will be one day, because I think it's important that the player have some idea what it is they're looking at. So like that is why this conveyor belt has a texture on it so that you can see that it's moving because I think that's important information to you even though this is the early rough version. If it was just white boxes moving, you couldn't even tell. Um, Absolutely. At this stage, when say you're making uh, prototypes uh, of like a level like a boat, like the one we're seeing right now, do you already have it in mind that this there's there is going to be this uh, family-based uh, narrative uh, and sort of, uh, dare I say, themes of, of imposter syndrome turned into a, a, a sort of physical comedy? Uh, I would say, so like 
in the earliest pitch of Octodad, um, I think it was like more or less the second idea, right? The first idea is Octodad's an octopus um, and he can't let anybody know. Like he's a secret octopus. And then part two of the idea when we developed the pitch more was he has a family. <laughs> so like that was super important early on in the project is that he is a family man. Uh, because of course, like if he has a full human family, uh, one, it is much harder for him to blend in as a person in this life. And two, way funnier. <laughs> yes. Uh, because it does just raise a host of questions. A host of questions that um, you, as the maker of the game, may or may not allow or address at the end of the day for the sake uh, of comedy. Exactly. Well, yeah. to me, uh, it's better to raise questions than to answer them. Yes. So I, I think that um, as far as the imposter syndrome and kind of the empathy at the heart of Octodad's character, that is something that, you know, the longer we spend with the character in the world is something we dig into more and more. Because at the start, we're uh, mostly just focused on the comedy of the situation. But me especially, I can't help but whenever an absurd situation is created, kind of think about what it would be like to actually live it mm -hmm. um, and the feelings that it would pull out of you. And so that is where I think the, the pathos of Octodad as an imposter in this world comes from and the kind of absurdity that uh, human life has when you're a tentacle being right like as an outsider looking in because uh, I think that that's what comedy is good at is drawing out the empathy of absurd situations absolutely so do you think for, more often than not that there is that then the identification where the player becomes closer to Octodad than the, the, the humans that uh, are not noticing that he is secretly an octopus I guess I don't know if you want to speak for your player base or not. Yeah, I mean, I do think that each player is going to experience their, their, uh, I guess, inhabiting of Octodad differently because people take a lot of different um, themes and messages out of the game based on their own experience. Um, sure. But I, I do think that uh, part of the, the core of empathy and something video games are especially good at is making you live a situation. Uh, because it is you who is Octodad. You're the one who's stuck uh, trying to figure out how to navigate a grocery store with these legs. Uh, and so you understand uh, what a tough life he has. <laughs> yeah. I'm currently throwing fish at this chef. That is... <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought it was, it was worth mentioning uh, verbally. To reset, we've made it to a part of the boat where Octodad is picking fish up off a conveyor, conveyor belt and throwing them at chefs that would be uh, Fishermen in a later version of the game. <laughs> uh, we actually completely redid uh, this portion a couple times. Uh, there was, uh, by, by the time of release in the game, this particular challenge was a stealth segment where you just needed to escape from the chef. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, after release, we later changed it to be a dance-off. Oh. Uh, uh, on the basis that the, the stealth challenge was just not very fun as we originally made it. And yeah. also uh, having to pretend to be the captain of this boat and do a jig was right. uh, another thing that was much, much funnier. <laughs> and it plays to the strengths of this uh, tentacled being. Yes. And it also is a great example of nonviolent conflict. Yes. Because yeah. uh, Octodad is not a fighter. Right. He is just trying to live a normal life. Well, <laughs> here he's he's chucking some fish. So yes, um, but we stepped away from that. Yeah, uh, there is no actual ending to this level, which is another thing that speaks to how early in development it is. Right, it just kind of stops. Uh, I can't help but notice that you seem very adept at uh, navigating uh, or to, to, and manipulating Octodad. I would suppose that would come with the territory of spending so so much time. Uh, with this character for for how many years now? Uh, God, uh, hmm. approaching nine, ten yeah. if you're counting the student game. So yeah. yeah. Ooh, does that mean we're having a tenth anniversary celebration of Octodad sometime soon? Sooner or later, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is uh, horrible for me to say for my own like <laughs> sense of age, but yeah. but yeah, I mean, I've certainly played Octodad way too much. 
right. I, I could do anything with this character. It's not a challenge for me. And this is difficult when designing the game. Yeah. Because uh, in both Octodads, we kept trending into areas where we were making the game uh, hard to us, which as masters of manipulating Octodad was not the correct amount of difficult for it to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was part of that. The reason we didn't like that stealth segment is that to us, it was like, oh yeah, you just do this little escape sequence. They're like, no, for regular players, this is too much. Yeah. Uh, very, yeah. The, di the di perennial difficulty for all players of games to be able to see the subjectivities of your entire audience at once, it's not really possible, but you, you try your best through through place testing and feedback as much as you can. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm trying to think of a clever segue to, because I, I know you had, uh, perhaps some other demos uh, ready for us as well. Uh, so I guess that, that was not so much a clever segue as a blunt segue. Um, <laughs> but so 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 Octodad uh, comes out of your experience as a student, uh, then the deadliest catch version is made after that to, uh, shall I say, international acclaim? <laughs> if you'd like. I would like to say that. Uh, and then uh, what, uh, what year does that bring us to when when you start thinking about what we now today know as bug snacks? Uh, so I guess that roughly would bring us to 2015 uh, after we finished like all the Octodad DLC levels, mm -hmm. um, which we called the shorts. Um, uh, then we had started talking about making a new game. Uh, we went through that process again where everybody on the team was making pitches for ideas. Uh, and once again, all the other ideas didn't get made, and some of them did get made by other people other than us. Um, but Bug Snacks was the one we narrowed down to. And once again, those ideas were made by people, other people were just organically on the world and not yes. spin-offs spin -offs of Young Horses collaborators? It just happens that way. Interesting, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I am, of course, glad that we went with Bug Snacks because, as I said, nobody else would ever make this game. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, so getting through that pitching process, the first version of Bug Snacks was pretty different from what it is now uh, in that we were doing a Pokemon Snap mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very on rails game. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of proceeded on a cart and then uh, caught the Bug Snacks by throwing things at them. Uh, but we abandoned that idea because we it was not actually very fun. But it, was it still, did it involve photography like Pokemon Snap? No, you, you still caught bug snacks. Like okay. the core the core of the idea was still, you catch bug snacks, you go feed them to grumpuses. Right. It's just that the actual catching of it was done on rails. Was on rails and, okay. It was, was still with like snack traps and this kind of thing? Uh, the, the traps were a bit different because you didn't have as much control over their uh, placement. So it was less based on placement and more based on just raw hucking. Yeah. Uh, like we had nets that you would throw. We had like a vacuum trap that you would throw to suck bug snacks into it. Um, but we decided to move away from that because again, we didn't think it was that fun. Uh, sure. it, part, of, part of the thing about Pokemon Snap is that one, it's got Pokemon in it. So easy sell, but- It does tend to make things a bit more popular. Yeah. So why don't you leave, leave <laughs> hey kids, how about you leave your parents forever and just hunt for pets? Uh, uh, there's no other concerns for resources or food or shelter or anything that makes uh, it popular. Absolutely. But then th thing number two about it is that uh, I think photography is so quick and easy compared to trying to like throw traps and catch something that our version of it was just very frustrating. Okay. So it's like, I think, you know, the mechanic didn't suit it. Uh, so then we made an attempt to make it, we're just like, all right, get rid of the rails, let you wander and catch bug snacks freely. Mm -hmm. And so this is the result of my first, uh, like attempt at a level where you did that. The, fir the first time we are liberating the catcher of bug snacks from the linear rails. So uh, this is also uh, a very early version of what would become the Frosted Peak one day, which is one of the later levels in the game. Uh, 
this sign indicates that there are nine bug snacks in the level. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can see there's also one Grumpus down there. Uh, that is an early model of Philbo, though this character is technically not Philbo. Okay. We'll go talk to them later. Um, but yeah, here... Uh, so is it, like in, when he's controlling a character, the limbs are invisible. Uh, we're going yeah, there, there's no player now. model at this time. Yeah. But there's a button. And what would you call the uh, the red uh, stone? Uh, so, right. yeah, at the time, I just called these pester balls because we took them from Pokemon Snap. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> uh, these are the earliest precursor to the what are now the sauces. Yeah. Uh, as as kind of a tool that allowed you to manipulate where bug snacks went. So on the left we've got the snack the snap trap. Uh, here it is just made out of cardboard boxes from Octodad. Uh, you place it down, bug snacks walk into it, you catch them. Bug catch. <laughs> yes. That is that is the UI that I made by myself. <laughs> nice. Um we just caught a bug, and we got a nice, uh, uh, active, energetic congratulations saying, bug catch. Um, and so this, uh, contrary to the nets that you would throw in the earliest version of Bug Snacks, I was like, all right, so I'm going to focus on this trap that you place onto the ground and let Bug Snacks walk into. Uh, and it opens up all floppy and ridiculous uh, to make it fun. Uh, and then so these, these pester balls... Uh, their purpose is to get bug snacks to do things. So the idea is that you can throw them in order to get bug snacks to run away. Mm -hmm. They don't like them. They're allergic can, to those pester balls. Yeah, you can see them sort of pulsate in an obnoxious way. Yeah. Um, but uh, the reason we moved away from uh, things that push bug snacks away is that it's really hard to predict what direction they're actually going to go in 3D right. space. Right. Uh, whereas if you have like an object that you throw down to make them come towards it, you know where they're going. They're going to it. Right. Um, and that just kind of wound up better. However, in this level, there's a bunch of different uses for it. You can like throw it at objects in order to break them. Like this Pinantula was hiding under a snowbank. Um, you can throw it at this uh, ball of fire to knock it down and turn it off. Uh, I think over here... Like, I've got a bunch of bug designs that we didn't end up using, but which I threw into this level to try and kind of experiment with what these mechanics would do. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, if you get rid of this fireball, this this flaming bug snack uh, doesn't want to stay out in the cold. It wants to stay near a source of fire. And so if you eliminate the sources of fire by throwing this ball at it, uh, it runs away and eventually gets so cold uh, that it freezes in place. Oh, I didn't get it. There we go. Uh, it stops moving and now it's frozen. <laughs> um, and we'd use versions of this idea later as far as like fiery bugs in a frozen area. Right. Uh, bug catch. But some main oh. lessons learned is that if you're trying to, you know, build a game off of influencing all these uh, bugs, Nexus behaviors, repelling them away was not like the best way to line up a, a trap moment. No, it, it was much more frustrating than it needed to be. Uh, however, uh, keeping the ideas of like messing with the environment and messing with their behavior and movement, that all stayed. Yeah. Uh, and this trap is almost exactly the way it is in the final game, other than uh, its graphics. Um, well, and the fact that it's floating out in front of your face all the time instead of safely tucked away in your UI, but that's prototypes. Yeah. Uh, we also have this uh, giant wind shooting bug snack. Um, it doesn't like traps. It will throw ice and wind at them. It might be slightly broken, but of course it is. It's a prototype. Oh yeah, it doesn't like these uh, pasture balls, and it will shoot air at them to blow them away. Yeah. Um. So, I yes. want to ask, similar to, uh, you know, when uh, with Doctor Dad dealing with this, like. A uh, very meaningful and and discussable and relatable uh, theme of you know uh, hiding the 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 self that is sort of like plainly out there mm -hmm. for all to see, uh, and that sort of meets its 
uh, partner in uh, the physical comedy uh, movement mechanics. Uh, what about, so Bug Snacks, on yes. the other hand, is a first person exploration game. And yes, you catch Bug Snacks and you feed them to Grompuses, but it's also, uh, if I may have my own interpretive moment, a game about uh, community and relationships and how very difficult they are to maintain. Uh, and how, what about the first person exploration format uh, helps s address that kind of subject, uh, which is a big subject. Uh, uh, yeah, what, what about that, that format, you know, uh, g gave you the, the, the space to, to, to talk about what you wanted to talk about? I, that's a great question. I, I think that um, being first person in this game, especially, uh, I think it's important that you are a character who lives in this world. Um, and th this is like the main reason that the journalist doesn't have a, a defined name or a defined look is because effectively the journalist is supposed to be you if you lived here. And we're a grumpus. And we're a grumpus and also a journalist. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's like a certain amount to which you need to like come meet the game as far as yeah. like you playing this role. But yeah. for all other intents and purposes, you're experiencing the game as yourself. Um, and I think being in first person, uh, walking up to these characters and getting to know them as, as they talk to you, um, like makes it feel more, uh, more personal to you. Yeah. Because it's you who's getting involved in this community. Um, and I think what's good about third person games is embodying a character. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it works for Octodad because Octodad is a very distinct character. Um, and you, need to be aware of where his body is. <laughs> right. um, but in this game, where you are yourself, I think being first person matters a lot. Absolutely. Um, and also, not only does it let you uh, project your own you know, life and experience into what you're seeing, but it also gives you all the abilities to, to get you know, frustrated or fall in love with or anything in between with all of these other grumpuses on the island, right? Yeah. The opportunity to be like, yeah, fine, I will go get that thing for you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on player motivation um, as far as why you're doing things. Um, yeah. Always establishing a clear reason. And that, too, I think is part of the theme uh, is getting getting you to care about yeah. all of this. Um, because I know that a lot of people... Uh, initially think um like this is very goofy like i'm not going to take it seriously but over time like they slowly get situated in this world uh and get used to the way it is and do start to feel empathy yeah. um for these characters and their situations they they stop they stop seeing um kind of the the layer that is not uh usual to our world if that makes sense yeah uh and this is kind of similar to like when you've played octodad for a long time you get very good at controlling his body when you mm -hmm. when you've played bug snacks for a really long time this is all extremely normal uh and one of the funniest things about it was um uh, on announcing the game being hit with like oh yeah this sounds completely absurd to anyone listening to us <laughs> Right, like even right. even describing any amount of this game sounds like nonsense. I'm like, yeah. cool, great, I love it. Well, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's <laughs> it's not exactly the same, but somewhat in common with telling people that you work with a art gallery just for video games. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you get some reactions. They're like, you are from another planet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think I can at least relate to some extent. Um, but yes, the, the first, that's a, I really appreciate that answer. The first person perspective then is, is critical. You, really, you could not do without it. I mean, it just wouldn't work if you were stuck on a rail. Like you just wouldn't have the kind of ownership of uh, being a part of this community like at all. And that ends up being sort of the core of the story of the game. Um, 
and and you're, and you're rewarded also but when you do choose to participate and you get involved with all the other grumpus's relationships and you find out why they might be longing for each other or have been hurt by each other you you still um after hearing all these tales you still get to party with them right you still get to enjoy of the victories of when the community lines up and does well for each other yeah yeah i i mean to me um like, you know, of course, in the arc of the story, it's important to establish how bad things have gotten before they can get good again. <laughs> right. Um, so that it does, you do feel uh, kind of the weight of how important it is uh, to have seen how bad things can get for these characters when their community is broken apart. Um, yeah. And starting at that lowest point and building them back up character by character um, was kind of, I think, when I talked about player motivation, that's what I mean is you and your desire to to help put it back together right uh it, even and and person to person like when you walk in on philbo laying on the ground struggling <laughs> you're like i gotta help this guy yeah. it's, it's funny because <laughs> in, uh in the earlier in the earlier versions of that level uh it was philbo who came up to you to help you after you fell off that cliff you'd be like oh let me help you up buddy because they're like oh it, you know, if Philbo helps you, um, like you'll uh, you'll get along with him better. That was our thinking at the time. Uh, but it was, but then uh, all of our playtesters, our playtesters would ask when Philbo's like, "All right, can you go get me bug snacks?" They're like, "Why do I have to do it? You seem fine." <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, I've got to. Okay, um, so, so we reversed it. We're like, okay, so Philbo is very obviously unable to do it himself, which is why he needs your help. Right. Um, and and that kind of became uh, extrapolated out over the cross of the game, making it obvious why everyone needs your help became yeah. a big part of the game. <laughs> yeah. And you understand why they need your help, but at certain points you just feel like, you know, <laughs> it's true. get your own bug snacks. <laughs> That's true. Now, sometimes it is not always um, uh, like Philbo. It's not always because they're like hungry and dying on the ground. Sometimes they need your help in a more emotional way. Yeah, right. Uh, so I have uh, been selfishly asking you these questions that I'm very interested about these sort of like large overarching questions about where uh, form meets concept. Um, and I think it's really interesting to be able to talk about uh, how that's happened with both of these projects over like a huge arc of time. Um, I must uh, say to the audience, this is a great time uh, to field any questions if you have them. Honestly, we're taking them live. Whatever you'd like to ask Zune about bug snacks, about Octodad, about uh, uh, moving from a, uh, a, a student of games into the world of working in games, uh, I'm happy uh, to Take them, and then Super Producer Bryce will flash them on the screen for us to talk about. But until we get a question uh, along those lines from the audience, I do want to. I don't. I'm not. I don't. No pressure to actually also produce a demo supporting this. But can you tell us about Ant Ambassador, <laughs> and, and if the experience of Ant Ambassador has informed either of the projects we've already looked at? So yeah, Ant Ambassador. Um... Like, Ambassador is a game that I and some of the young horses made as part of the Ludum Dare, which is a, um, a very fast game-making contest. Uh, you have, in the basic version, 48 hours, and in the jam version, 72 hours to make a game from scratch. Uh, and then you submit it, and then it is judged by the other participants in the contest. Um, just to, I don't know, see how you did. So it's a game jam project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I really liked participating in game jams uh, during, I would say, most of Deadliest Catch's development, especially because uh, I had a lot of free time back then. <laughs> uh, I have less so now, so I don't get to game jam as much as I'd like to. Uh, and I haven't done one in many years now. but. Yeah, at the time, um, you know, every every year or so, I would do a game jam uh, for either Ludum Dare or another jam like Global Game Jam that came up, um, and 
uh, ambassador, I uh, I often worked with uh, Chris Dahlman, which is the uh, lead artist at Young Horses. Um, and we made all kinds of things. Like uh, there's a game called Batteries Not Included, which was like an Adventure Time fan game. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, First You Take a Potato, which was a one screen game where you win by doing nothing. <laughs> um, but so in the spirit of that, as, as we kind of collaborated on these little micro games, mm -hmm. uh, we made Ambassador uh, out of the Deadliest Catch engine. We're like, hey, we've got, we've got this fun physics-based game engine we've been working on for a few years, and we know how to use it pretty good now. Uh, let's make a game in that, because the previous ones were made in Game Maker. Octodad and, has its own engine from scratch that I uh, it It's not quite from scratch. It's based on an open source engine called Erlicht, okay. um, which uh, we used for our student capstone game, uh, and then subsequently used for Octodad student game. Uh, and then just kept using. <laughs> right. So yeah, so you had you got some experience with that. You sort of built on top of that for Octodad. We're like, mm -hmm. let's see what else this baby can do. Let's try to squish some ants. Yeah. Well, yeah. so well, try not to squish ants as but it not, is. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, and yeah. So the the theme of that game jam was connected worlds, uh, and so in the spirit of using Octodad's game engine, I was like, all right, you're connecting the worlds of humans and ants. That was the <laughs> genesis for that one. Um, and uh, like, so also in the spirit of Octodad, gonna be a wacky physics game <laughs> um, where you are trying to do something you're not well suited to. So in this case, if you're a human interacting with ants, you're a giant hand, right? right? That's all of the human you can see. Uh, all right, I've successfully pulled up Ant Ambassador. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, great. I am, um... It is a very short game. Here we are, learning the backstory of Ambassador. I got a, I got a level with, with uh, Yuzun and the audience. The way I have my notes on my screen covered up the fact that we had some beautiful questions from the audience. Oh, so we did? Kind of, okay. Kind of if I ask them as you demo? Uh, yeah, and... absolutely. There, awesome. I've, I've answered all that exists about Ambassador. <laughs> Uh, the fun, it was a short, fun project, and the way it influenced us was by working together as a team on small ideas. So uh, here are some great questions from the audience. Uh, uh, this is particularly on Grumpuses. When did you start to think about uh, how the relationships between the Grumpuses would work, the individual Grumpus dynamics? So um, like that was very early on in the project. Uh, kind of after we had solidified this new direction for the gameplay uh, with the hunting in 3D space, uh, we had also been talking about like how the interaction with Grumpuses would work as uh, defined characters who live in a town together. And so we kind of developed their individual archetypes for what kind of character they would be. We were like, oh, we're going to have like a farmer character who um, is trying to grow bug snacks like plants and it's not working out for him, uh, which eventually became Wambus. Right. But then um, after having developed each of the individual archetypes, uh, the absolute next step was, okay, how do they all know each other? Right, like they're a, they're a community in this game. Uh, so obviously they have some kind of relationships. And basically I just went in and drew a bunch of lines between all the characters mm -hmm. and went, all right, uh, based on their personalities, these two would get along, these two would hate each other uh, in an interesting enough way that it would be relevant to the story. Did it look like one of those red yarn diagrams that when a character in a movie is trying to like solve a crime by themselves? <laughs> Absolutely, know? it did. Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on, we're at the hardest part of it, Ambassador. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, but to continue to answer the question, yeah, so that, that was figured out immediately after we knew who the characters were. And the way those relationships were uh, formed kind of I then informed how the story would play out. So like knowing what kind of community they were guided me as to which characters you would meet in what order right. and kind of how their conflicts would drive the story. Would that then inform like individual missions that then would have to be built out practically and mechanically? 
Yes. Yeah. Amazing. So like all the missions were based on who the characters were. Right. Character driven narrative. There's uh, more excellent questions from the audience. How about this one? How did it feel to get such a passionate fan base so suddenly for Bug Snacks? Uh, so the answer is extremely gratifying. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, uh, we were very isolated with this project for a lot of years. Nobody knew we were making it. We weren't very public about it. Uh, and so there was a lot of concern uh, in our team, like whether Bug Snacks would take off and um, like whether we would follow up Octodad with a hit. Uh, and, you know, me personally, uh, as the one who wrote all this down, um, you know, I wanted to know that these characters would have fans. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I was extremely happy to see, uh, I don't know what a big response the fans had to it. Uh, and I, uh, especially for the first several weeks, just like submerged myself in it. In the, in the reaction. Yeah. To all the characters. Yeah. Just yeah. like looking at all the fan work, uh, like sharing it with the other young horses and they were sharing it with me. And I don't know, it was, it was great. That sounds terrific. Cause you didn't make those characters to be ignored. Right? No, but it's also got to be gratifying to know that people are paying attention to the different levels and points of entry that are available in a video game, which as we know, you can, you know, engage with however you please. Right. So they chose to, to really uh, latch into and develop the relationships with the characters that you wanted them to have relationships with. Um, what, uh, oh, here's another one. Uh, did anything get left behind in the development that you wish ha you hadn't? I, I, th I imagine this is also talking about bugs next. Anything uh, that didn't, didn't make it to the final product that was, like, that was a heartbreaker to lose along the way? Uh, great question. I think that um, if, I, if I were heartbroken about anything, it would be about all the bug designs that didn't make it. Because uh, they were, they were, uh, many more bug snacks that didn't come to be that mm -hmm. I was a huge fan of. <laughs> uh, where we concepted them, we had the pictures, some of them even got uh, rudimentary models, but didn't make the cut. Dare I say DLC? <laughs> <laughs> you dare say it. Yeah. We are we are working on new content, we just yeah. haven't said what yet. Okay. Um, Fair. How, uh, however, yeah, uh, and in terms of uh, I'm like, cause like the, uh, none of the characters got cut. All the characters that I started with stayed in the game. So I don't feel bad about any of them. Um, I think there are some mechanics I thought were neat that we didn't end up really using. Mm -hmm. Uh, like wind was going to be one of the major elemental, uh, mechanics in the game. Uh, and we only, it only shows up like a couple times. Mm -hmm. Just ended up being too many features so you just have to scale back the elements part part of it was that <laughs> part of it was that we never got wind to look good okay so that kind of made it harder to like put it in the levels yeah I'm like because people would be like oh what are these giant farts flying through the sky right here i'm like that's the wind <laughs> yeah um well i'm glad you have avenue the right format the right uh avenue for perhaps providing these things to the world if and when you, you choose to do so. Soon, I gotta tell you, we have mm -hmm. been talking for a full hour and it has gone by way faster than I thought it would. But of course, this is always the case when we're doing this sort of thing. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit bad and, and ask if I could do one more question before we wrap up. Oh, because absolutely. That I've been at, asking uh, all the guests that come through VGA Fireside, which is uh, about uh, locality and region and how it affects uh, games or makers of games. And I'm interested to get sort of everyone's take on it as they uh, come through VGA Fireside. So uh, I guess, that, yeah, the question is, uh, how much do you think one's region or physical location uh, becomes imprinted in the games they make? Is there something about a city or a place or a community that uh, is, there's a residue of that place in the work itself? Uh, I think absolutely there is because, you know, the, the work we make is a product of our own experience and, and the community we live in is a part of that experience as well. So I think even if you were trying to make a game that was somehow universal, I don't think you could ever stop yourself from instilling it with the, the values and ideas of the place that you are. Um, 
Is there anything in particular about being based in Chicago and, and being in the Chicago games community that you feel uh, is is manifested in the work of Young Horses? <laughs> if I were going to pick an obvious thing, it would be the joke about the Chicago hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Uh, anything that's a little more subtle, you know, like, <laughs> uh, we, we, we afforded ourselves an opportunity not to be subtle about where we're from on that one. Nice, uh, yeah. We, we argued a lot about whether or not we should put in a joke about Chicago hot dogs on the basis that people outside of Chicago wouldn't know about them and our, and our, uh, anti ketchup stance. Is that oh. ketchup? Mola says, I didn't know about Chicago hot dogs. You know, once again, it shows if you're in one planet for too long, you realize what, what is normal around you is not normal all the places. Yeah, well, there's a Chicago hot dog. It's better well, than other hot dogs. So another thing that's interesting, and th this came from uh, localizing the game, in, in me having to explain to the localizers uh, all of the puns, jokes, and references in the entire game really gave me a window into how many things were local to the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because for instance, like the 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 peel bug, uh, orange, green, and yellow peel bugs. Mm -hmm. This is a joke that they are a peel and they are a pill bug. But pill bug is a regional term. Like right. there, there is so many different names that people have for that bug. Right. Right. It's a roly poly. There are places that call it a slater. Mm -hmm. uh, there are places that call it a woodlouse. Uh, and so, like, and even in those subtle ways, like the language we use to describe things, even among other uh, speakers of English, uh, tells you a lot about where we're from. Right. Woodlouse sounds a lot worse than than pillbug. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it's giving a bad rap to that same insect. Yeah. So the insect double entendre could be easily missed. But then I guess it just there's plenty of other things to enjoy in the game. So if you miss that, hopefully you enjoy something else. And the person who does connect with the pill bug language play uh, <laughs> feels like a little extra scene uh, from the region they come from. Uh, that is terrific. I really appreciate you. First of all, taking the time to come on this program. I've, I can't believe I've, I almost don't want. To, to close our session because there were other awesome questions and we've been, I've been having an excellent time. But uh, we don't want to keep our audience or you longer uh, on the internet than we already spend. So we are going to wrap up and we do this thusly. Kevin Zoo, this is the internet. And when we finish a conversation that's recorded, we simply must plug things. It's just the rules. Of course. What would you like to plug? I guess I might as well plug Bug Snacks. Let's plug Bug Snacks. Play Bug Snacks. It's good. You'll like it. <laughs> Why not play Bug Snacks? Um, <clears throat> what uh, kind of computer devices can people? Uh, there it is. It's in the. Um, it's in our our ticker graphic. We got PC. Yeah, uh, yeah it's PS5. on PC on the Epic Game Store. It's on PS5 and PS4. Bugsnacks.com for more information. Anything else about uh, the the many fine labors of the young horses you want to plug, or is it just we're just bug snacks in it? I mean, yeah, play Octodad also while you're at it. Do it. If you're not done it. Do it. It's still out there. Play, uh, play, play Ambassador. Go go to my itch.io page. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I'm sure the the the, the page info uh, Bryce can add in the the ticker. I will also say if you enjoyed this program. Please consider supporting VGA. We are a not-for-profit arts organization that hubs out of Chicago. You can support us by buying fine art prints. That's right, artwork that you can frame, or we can frame for you, and you can put it into your house uh, to say, uh, I appreciate works of fine art. I enjoy uh, uh, meaningful video games, and I also like supporting not-for-profit organizations. All those things are said when you purchase a fine art print from the VGA website. You can also just donate. If you don't want the print and you just want to support us, you can just give us money. You can do that through the, through the website as well. And that supports us to make programs like this, as well as our ongoing uh, uh, web publication, the VGA Zine, uh, which you can sign up for to receive in your own inbox. And uh, watch out for uh, the VGA Reader, our peer-reviewed journal on uh, video game art. Um, that's out there and, and the, the sorts of contributions support the reader as well. Uh, anything else I should uh, uh, mention about how to support VGA Bryce? Oh, not gonna forget this this time. Join us next month 
when our uh, we'll have another episode of EGA Fireside for you, and our special guest then will be uh, Milo Santani and Marina Kitika of Analgesic Productions. It's the first time we've had things booked far off in advance that I can make that announcement and also remember to do it before the episode was over. Great job, Chaz. Um, so yeah, please, that'll be the, the final Wednesday uh, in June, June 30th. Please join us for another rousing conversation uh, with artists who make games then. Uh, and before we go, let me just uh, show my gratitude to all the people uh, that we were previously shown gratitude and deserve gratitude again. Thank you, producer and director of ops, Bryce Poles. Thank you, designer and director of communications, Eleanor Schichtel. Thanks to the VGA staff and the VGA board. Thanks to the Independent Game Designers Association Chicago chapter. Thank you, Ross, for spreading the word. Thanks to the Media Arts and Game Design module of Northwestern University. Uh, thank you, Oske. Thanks to the DePaul game development students. Thanks to Caleb. Uh, thanks to Electric Mirrors for our intro music. Thank you to the Oldham Music Center Youth Brass Band for our beautiful fanfare. And if you know an organization or group that would like to be interested or that would be interested in this program or have feedback of any kind, please drop us a line at info at vgagallery.org. We would love to hear from you. Anything else, Kevin, before uh, Bryce takes us out? Just thanks for having me. Uh, shout out to everybody who came here from the Bug Snacks Discord. Thanks for stopping by. Absolutely. Thanks to all you Bug Snacks Discorders and everyone who joined us tonight. So from me, Chaz Evans, VGA Director of Exhibitions, thanks for joining us. And from all of us at VGA Fireside, stay warm. <laughs>